Lenny, um, we are punctual. Um, it's a real pleasure to introduce Lenny Teitelman, um, who is the uh, co-founder and CEO of Protocols IO. Uh, Lenny has over a decade of computational experimental biology experience. And uh, I hope he tells this story. He did his graduate studies at UC Berkeley, and it was his struggle with uh, correcting a published research method as a postdoc at MIT, which you, which you just mentioned, that led him to co-found Protocols IO. Uh, Lenny brings to Protocols a strong passion for open access, sharing knowledge, and improving research efficiency through technology. And um, when I was involved with the Global, Global Biological Standards Institute, GBSI, um, I had some terrific um, interactions with Lenny uh, as we were fighting the good fight around uh, reproducibility. And here we are uh, at Frederick National Laboratory with this new seminar series um, called High Fidelity, where uh, we also feel very uh, passionately about the importance of standards and reference materials and open access. So, Lenny, you are the kickoff speaker of this very new uh, seminar, inaugural seminar series, uh, and it's really a pleasure to have you. Uh, the title of Lenny's talk is For Reproducibility. We knew we need the methods behind the data. So, it's all yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Len, and thank you everybody for taking the time um, to attend. It's an absolute pleasure. Um, I will spend most of my time, not specifically on protocols.io, but just talking about method sharing in general, the challenges of doing it, the issues behind it. I'll talk a little bit about protocols. As Len said, I am the CEO. Um, and then plenty of time for questions um, at the end. Before I start, uh, Len just hinted at the story. Um, before I start with the actual talk, um, the reason um, my background, as Len said, is in uh, genetics and computational biology. Um, I was always on the academic track. I had no entrepreneurial ambitions. I was never thinking of uh, startups or leaving the academic track. Um, and it was really in the postdoc, the first year and a half at MIT, where literally that first year and a half went into correcting just a single step of the method that I was using. So it was a single cell RNA fish microscopy in yeast. Um, and it was working beautifully on wild type, but uh, the, the collaborator strain from Harvard Medical School I would put it under the microscope and I saw no RNA. I kept thinking I'm doing something wrong. It's, you know, Lenny, the mathematician, computational biologist, trying to be at the bench. Maybe I didn't learn enough of the uh, molecular biology wet lab skills during the PhD. Um, but then I ended up going to the Harvard lab, doing a northern blood, seeing tons of RNA with that yeast strain coming back to the MIT lab, putting the other half of the culture on the microscope and I see nothing. And it took me a year and a half to discover that just one step, right? Instead of a microliter of an enzyme for digesting the cell wall, we needed five. Instead of 15 minute incubation with that enzyme, we needed an hour. And then you realize after that year and a half that this is not a new method. This is not a new technique. It's a correction of something previously published. And that means that I don't get any credit for that time of the postdoc. And more importantly, everybody else who's using that exact same technique is either getting completely misleading single cell results or has to spend a year or two rediscovering that modification. Right? And so eventually I became obsessed um, with creating a central place where it's easy to share these details and keep them up to date. But that's the Lenny sub story, uh, but I usually start my talks with one of my favorite tweets from a postdoc at UC Riverside, um, who is talking about reading a paper and he says, looking for a protocol in 97 paper as described in 96, finds 96 paper as described in 87, finds 87 paper, paywall. 
And that's a very common and frustrating experience when reading papers. Um, it's not just a biologist. Here is similar complaint from a physicist. Devices were fabricated as previously described, previously described, previously described, original reference devices were fabricated with conventional methods. So this is, I have, I bookmark these as I come across them and I would spend the next hour and a half just going through all of them uh, in my collection. So reach out to me if you're interested in seeing the other tweets along these lines. Um, but obviously it's a very common issue when we're reading research papers. And my favorite blog post uh, on this, not a tweet, but my favorite blog post is from a professor in Canada. Uh, Len knows this team very well. There was a um, pretty large scale effort called Reproducibility Project in Cancer Biology that was a collaboration between Science Exchange and the Center for Open Science. And what they did is pick 50 high profile cancer papers that have been published and just try to see, can they get the exact same results of the key um, experiments in those papers reproduced in a different lab? And uh, when, when they did the first five of those 50 papers, um, I think they started in 2015 and 2017, they published in eLive the results from trying to replicate the first five papers. And there was a lot of media attention to it. Um, Box wrote about it, scientists need Scientists and journals need to get better at describing their methods and sharing data. And my favorite coverage was a pretty extensive piece on it in The Atlantic by Ed Young. And he wrote about it that the hardest part by far was figuring out exactly what the original labs actually did. Scientific papers come with method sections that theoretically ought to provide recipes for doing the same experiments, but often those recipes are incomplete missing out important steps, details, or ingredients. In some cases, the recipes are not described at all. Researchers simply cite an earlier study that used a similar technique. And further on in the article, he quotes uh, Tim Arrington, who was leading this from the Center for Open Science side. So in every case, he, meaning Tim Arrington, had to ask the scientists behind the original experiments for the details of their work. Oftentimes, the person who actually did the experiments had left the lab, so an existing team member had to rummage through old notebooks or data files. The project ended up being hugely time-consuming for everyone concerned. We spent a boatload of time trying to get back to ground zero, says Arrington. And this, um, I highlight this and I spent so much time about, on it because, as I said on the previous slide, it's not just an issue of papers, right? The, the teams here had gone back to the laboratories to ask, so can you give us the full details? Can you give us the protocols? And those labs had hard time internally finding precisely what was done. And of course, for this project, that's a serious um, issue because if you don't get the exact step-by-step -step protocol that was followed for the results in the paper, you can't really replicate it. Um, whatever results, if you don't get the same results, people will always say, oh, but you just didn't do exactly what was in the original paper. So maybe it is reproducible, maybe it's not. And the end result was that a year and a half later, um, the entire project uh, stopped at just 18 out of the 50 papers they wanted to reproduce. And to a large extent, it was because they had such a hard time getting the details, forget about from the paper, published paper itself, but even when collaborating with the research group, um, the more time passes, the harder it is to find. So the issue and the challenge is around method capture, collaboration, development, and sharing before, during, and after publication. And that um, is precisely our mission which is to make that easier and to improve the, what I call internal reproducibility inside the laboratory long before you're publishing, make it easier to publish um, those details, more rigorous, more reproducible papers um, that are not just vague method sections like we saw at the top. And personally for me with my MIT postdoc story, um, it's equally important for methods specifically that 
you have versioning and you have the ability to update um, what uh, Dr. Emma Genley on our team calls dynamic permanence. So methods have a permanence, but they're also dynamic because we keep improving and iterating on them and optimizing and tweaking and correcting them. So at this point, I'll talk a little bit about what we have been doing at protocols.io since we launched in 2014. Um, if the internet cooperates, I'll do a very quick live demo. And uh, we are an open access platform. Um, it is free to read and free to publish. Our business model is everything is free if you're sharing publicly and openly. If you're using it internally as a company or an academic lab, um, for private collaboration, that's kind of like Slack, Dropbox, that's what we charge for. So I will obviously be showing public protocols. I'll obviously be showing public protocols, but it's the exact same functionality and every protocol starts out privately, kind of like Google Docs. Um, you decide when to share, who to share with, what permissions to give them. Is it view only or view and edit? Um, depending on the collaborator, and you decide when to make something public, if it's appropriate and when it's appropriate. So let me pull up an example public protocol. This used to be a lot easier to demo finding my uh, favorite example. It used to be a lot easier when we had just 20 public methods, not 9,000 like we do now. But this is a really nice illustration um, this is a protocol from a graduate student at Australia National University. And what you can see is that it's not just a PDF. As I'm scrolling through it, um, I can ask a question. I can comment. There are components. I'll talk a little bit more in a second around what that means. There's structure inside the protocol. So here's a step-by-step -step protocol. And when you get down to step 24, the instruction says, uh, do something for two to two minutes, air dry pellet for two to two minutes. Timer on it says seven minutes. And if you were cooking, this would be a rather vague instruction. And one of the researchers looking at it clicked on the step and you can see it on the right hand side asked, wait, what does it mean? Two to two minutes timer says seven, should it be two to seven minutes? And this question goes to everyone who's using the protocol to the author. The author responds not by email in a in a one on one private conversation, but responds publicly saying, whoops, that's a typo. It should be two to three minutes. And not only do you have this sort of public FAQ that grows on top of the protocols over time, but going back to my personal example in terms of keeping things up to date with a click of a button, the author can create a new version. So here's version four. Every version gets its own DOI. You can cite specifically the and precisely the version that was used in your research publication. And she corrects it. You can still see the previous version. In fact, there is a compare button that allows you to see the different versions side by side. So you can tell what's the same, what's different uh, between the steps. And versioning is for keeping for for keeping uh, protocols up to date. I obviously cannot version your uh, protocol if you're the author. That's only the author that can do that. But there is forking functionality. So every public or private protocol in protocols.io is sort of a template. I can click this copy fork button, and I can clone this. So if you're working with liver tissue and I'm working with lung um, cells, we might have slight tweaks and I can make a copy of your liver protocol. It becomes editable for me. I can use it internally, modify the one or two steps that need modification. And then if and when I'm ready, I can share it publicly. We try to give credit to both, both the original and the authors of the fork. So in fact, this protocol is itself a fork and you can see under the title, it says this is forked from another protocol, from another team, um, as you can see in here. And the same compare functionality applies. Um, and one of the last things 
as I said, I wanted it to be a really brief uh, demo. One of the last things um, in terms of the functionality on the protocol itself is that um, for wet lab protocols, we have, I think, 5 to 10% of the public protocols on protocols.io um, are computational workflows. Uh, code still goes on GitHub, but this is a way to uh, detail the pipeline. So if you're running BLAST, you can say what parameters, what cutoffs, what E value, which data set, which assembly of the genome did you use in your analysis? So you're capturing the exact flow of the computational pipeline. But for wet lab protocols, which is the majority of what is on protocols.io, there is a run button that actually allows me to step through the protocol as I'm doing the experiment on that particular day. So it's sort of like a checklist cooking up I'm on step one. Step two, if there is a timer, I can start it on my iPad or Samsung tablet right in the fume hood. Um, and you, importantly, as you're going through the protocol, not only do you see where you are, how much is left, what's next, but if you change anything, kind of like a lab notebook, you can click edit and you can say, actually, uh, I did it for 10 minutes instead of five minutes, or I did the experiment at room temperature instead of 30 degrees today. So you have a note of um, how exactly you did it on that particular day. And the last thing that I wanted to highlight is that it's not just a repository when you make something public. Um, with thousands and thousands of protocols, but we also have communities that allow you to organize the methods that have been developed um, and collaborate with others in the community. Just like protocols, the workspaces can be visible or invisible, public or private. And so here's an example of the Human Cell Atlas method development community. It's a public one, anyone can join it, and you can see there are almost 500 members. If you go to publications, you can see there's 170 of them. And what you can see is there are really robust discussions. Um, well, this is our most commented protocol from 2017 from the Hennikoff lab at the Fred Hutch. Um, so don't get scared if you share something on protocols.io, it's unlikely you'll have a thousand comments. Uh, that lab and Steve Hennikoff are particularly involved in method development, engaging community answering questions. Um, most protocols are like preprints on bioarchives. Some have questions, some do not. Um, but the beautiful thing around organizing methods for the community inside a single workspace is that you can see all of the discussions. If you're a member of the workspace, when a new version of a protocol appears, you will get an alert. So you can see this protocol from Wash U is on version eight. So you'll know when there is a new protocol, when there's an update, when there's a discussion that's happening, people share resources, whether it's Edgene, ATCC, computational tools. So this is a space, especially if you're new, when you're joining as a new postdoc or a new rotation student, um, this is a space to quickly get up to speed on what are the methods that people are using, what are the discussions, what is and isn't working. And th th this is uh, one of the uh, organic groups that obviously, for obvious reason, um, became quite popular over the last year. But it's another great example of a community where you have 500, you know, half a thousand scientists, a lot of protocols around both testing for coronavirus and uh, doing research, sequencing, and because of how rapidly this particular field is moving, right, um, there are, there's a lot of versioning, there are a lot of discussions, um, a lot of collaboration conversations that are happening here. So I'll stop there with the demo and just finish up with um, a few more slides and thoughts. And of course, we have a lot of functionalities. As I said, we went live in 2014. I'm not exhaustively showing you the powerful editor that we created for really capturing reagents, videos, and side steps. That's something that helps a lot with reproducibility and explaining the technique to someone else. Um, you can just take a video for 10 seconds on your phone, drop it into a step. 
And uh, if an image is worth a thousand words, videos are priceless uh, in word count. And uh, in terms of uh, our adoption, um, I th th this is the number of researchers every month that are creating protocols. So we're growing at about a thousand new public and private protocols every month. There is over 9,000 public ones, over 30,000 private ones, and there are over 500 researchers monthly that are creating and sharing methods. Uh, the graph starts in 2014, because if you go out to 2014, it's just too depressing, so I don't wanna see what it was like in the beginning of the startup days. There are a lot of organizations that uh, encourage use of protocols.io. There's over 500 journals that explicitly have protocols.io um, in the author guidelines. When you're submitting a paper, they encourage you to put um, a link to the detailed protocol in the method section. There are more and more funders that recommend or require grantees to share protocols and often um, specifically, these are all ones that specifically recommend protocols.io. And um, over the last year and a half, two years, more and more universities have started signing up for campus-wide licenses um, so that people can use it internally, not just for the free public sharing, but for teaching, for classes, for organizing all of the protocols inside an indiv individual uh, laboratory research group. Um, and this is a really important part that Whenever we talk about tools and platforms, I think everyone should be thinking about, you know, asking the questions of, will the tool be around in 10 years? What is their business model? Are they sustainable? Will they be around in 10 years? Will I still be able to see whether it's for-profit or non-profit? These are all important questions to ask. What's being done for preservation? Um, and so everything that's public on protocols.io, we send to uh, the clocks, uh, sort of digital library, long-term preservation archiving platform. We also mirror everything uh, on GitHub and uh, on the internet archive. We make it easy to export all of your private protocols. And we have well-documented public API uh, that allows for integration from other platforms. And uh, just moving back a little bit from protocols.io itself, um, you know, you might be thinking, well, the key part is sharing details um, and maybe it should just be a supplementary file, a PDF coupled with a paper. And I'm obviously biased uh, if, if we talk about this, but I do think there's a good reason to use repositories. This was an article in The Scientist uh, as you can see in the title, the push to replace journal supplements with repositories. And this article focuses, you can see broken links, clunky formats, outdated platforms that have authors and publishers turning to alternatives. This focuses more on the common occurrence of journal moving uh, platforms uh, from Highwire to Oxford University Press or vice versa, and suddenly all of the supplementary materials disappearing. The PDF is still there, but the supplementary files are gone. Um, but I think that there is an equally important reason to use repositories, and protocols.io is not the only one. Um, Nature Springer, uh, before it was Nature Springer, Nature in 2006 launched Protocol Exchange, which is an open access repository of methods. Um, obviously, there are more generalist repositories aside from protocols.io and protocol exchange. There is Zenodo, Figshare, so there are other places where protocols can go. What's really nice about putting your methods in a repository um, and then linking to it from the method section is it lives with other protocols, right? And so the reasoning is the same as um, putting our sequences in PDB or short read archive, right, and, and CBI, you don't want it on different lab websites. You want the sequences together so that you can search against all of the proteins, against all of the genomes, right, in one place. And great illustration for it is this exchange with a researcher from Chile asking, uh, I'm looking for someone with experience doing RNA extraction um, from primary cortical neuron cultures. Anybody? 
And a postdoc from UCSF says, oh, from the five or six on protocols.io, the basic trisal protocol here should work. You just need to adjust volume and cell number. And what I love about this example is that if you look at the paper itself, uh, it's a paper in GigaScience on the genome of a parasite of three spine stickleback fish, right? The protocol has nothing to do with cortical neuron cultures, which is the seed, the germ of the question here. And if the authors in this particular case, in this Giga Science paper, if the authors had instead used um, just a PDF supplementary file, chances that this researcher who is working on cortical neuron cultures is looking at three spine stickleback parasite paper and bounces across this protocol are close to zero. So that that's, I think, one of the most important arguments for using repositories um, when you are sh sharing publicly. Um, it allows for that dynamic per permanence. It accelerates science um, and lets people discover the protocols better. And um, I think one of the other things that are really important that are really important um, to keep in mind, I mentioned that there are different platforms where you can man uh, where where you can manage to share protocols. I am partial to protocols.io for obvious reasons, but regardless of what platform you're using, um, this is an obvious point, but it's something worth highlighting. Just because you shared something it doesn't mean that it's reproducible. It, it's, it's good when there is a link to protocols.io or uh, to a GitHub uh, repository with the protocol. It's good, but just as with sharing code and data, if you didn't comment it, if people can't understand what it's doing, it's not going to be very useful. The paper is, may not be any more reproducible uh, if you've shared the data with it, but there's no metadata and we don't know which cell lines um, and which columns and which gene name re represent which um, experiments. So we actually at protocols.io, we run um, a workshop called the Art of Writing Methods. Um, we do it in person, we do it virtually, and it feels like we should all just know how to do it, but it's an art um, and there are ways to make things more reproducible. I already mentioned videos, but the key thing in this talk that I want us uh, all to keep in mind is that just because you've shared it doesn't mean that it's reproducible and it does take effort and it does take time. And on that note, on that note, um, going back to the slide that I showed, um, the fact that being reproducible takes time that's um, that's an important point. I hope that other speakers um, in in your seminar series talk more about it. You know, I've I've highlighted these organizations, but this is a little bit top down, right? The universities, librarians encouraging use, funders, journals, and this is really important, right? Group leaders, funders, publishers all have a critical role to play in encouraging best practices and requiring data when you're submitting a journal, um, as many more and more publishers are doing following the, the lead of PLOS. Um, but this is top down. And even if a funder in the uh, grant proposal says, you know, you have to submit the data sharing plan, the funders often don't have compliance officers. Um, most of the time, they're not uh, keeping track of the grantees and reaching out to see, did you actually share the data? Did you actually share a protocol? Even if you agreed to. So funder mandates have huge incentive. They're hugely um, important. Same thing with journal publishers, but we don't check compliance uh, just because protocols is in the guidelines. Um, if I'm not already using protocols.io at the time when I'm submitting a paper, you're asking me to do more work. And if we go back to the previous slide, right, it takes time to write a reproducible protocol. It takes time to document your code. So at the point of submission of a paper, if 
if the journal and the publisher is the only place where we're trying to encourage your producibility, it's a little bit too late. Um, you've done a lot of work. It's hard. Um, science is taking longer and longer. There's a lot of evidence showing that it's harder and harder to get a paper. PhDs are taking longer and longer. And if we're now also asking the researchers to be more reproducible, um, that's yet an additional burden. So when we think about incentives, the funder journal institutional um, requirements and mandates are obviously key. But I think it's also important to keep in mind what is the benefit to the researcher, right? There's a benefit to the reader, but what's the benefit to the author? What's the benefit to the researcher before they're publishing? And some of the functionality that I showed you on protocols.io, we put a lot of effort into creating an editor specifically for methods, into adding that runtime <clears throat> functionality so that when a researcher gets on protocols.io on day one of joining the lab, hopefully the goal, the idea is that it should save you time long before you're ready to publish. And if we get the incentives right, if the tools and platforms are not just requirements at the point of publication, but are things that are helping you do your work throughout the research cycle over the five years, you know, GitHub, you don't use to share the code just because you're publishing GitHub, hopefully you're using as you're developing the algorithms as you're developing software because it just helps you collaborate and it helps you keep track of uh, your code. Same thing with protocols. Um, if we manage to succeed and saving time to researchers, that's a really strong incentive that um, is parallel to top-down mandates, requirements, um, and suggestions from uh, those key points like journals and publishers. And just two weeks ago, uh, as I wrap up, uh, I want to mention that speaking of incentives, just two weeks ago, um, we announced the launch of a partnership with Public Library of Science and Protocols.io for PLUS One, um, a new uh, paper type, which is uh, Lab Protocol. And you can see from the PLOS announcement. Um, this is a partnership with protocols.io. The protocol sits in protocols.io. It gets peer reviewed and you get a traditional paper and PLOS one, but this is a method peer review. And the whole idea around this is that we're trying to move towards what I was talking about on the previous slide, the incentives, right? Um, for an academic researcher, why do you take the time, you know, 1% of scientists are passionate about open science and reproducibility. So they will read author guidelines in a journal and say, I should do this. But 99% are overwhelmed, burdened, overburdened already, and they will not. And so what are the incentives to sharing on uh, whatever repository, but what are the incentives for sharing publicly on protocols.io? And coupled with what we hopefully um, achieved with the tool itself for private collaboration, just saving you time. When you're publishing things like this, like this initiative with PLOS, hopefully are giving more recognition, right? And credit for the method development, for the painstaking work of tweaking that one step over a year and a half so that you do get a publication out of it. And it's not just uh, a footnote, a side note in the method section um, of a bigger paper. Um, so we're trying to reward the scientists. We're trying to give them credit. And I do think that we can talk more in Q&A or in the round table that follows. I, I do think that incentives are key for uh, improving reproducibility. And with that, I want to acknowledge the small but amazing team on protocols.io that um, if you're playing around with protocols, if you're using it, we really welcome feedback. You can email me at Lenny at protocols.io or uh, info at protocols.io with questions, um, but we take suggestions, feedback, um, very seriously, we welcome it. And that's what helps us to build a platform that works for you and not just for uh, my former self in the lab. And uh, at the bottom, I want to acknowledge 
the generous funding from Gordon Betty Moore Foundation and uh, the Chen Zuckerberg Initiative and the first publisher partners, uh, Genetic Society of America, Giga Science, and Public Library of Science before the they were back in 2015, um, the, the, the uh, earliest adopters of protocols.io from the publisher side before the hundreds of other journals um, started doing the same. And I will stop sharing. Okay. Figure it out. There we go. So I'll step stop sharing there and would be delighted to take questions. Thank you, Lenny. That was that was terrific. And um, we have time. Uh, this is a little complicated, maybe more than it should be. We have time for some questions from the audience, and then we have a roundtable. Uh, for the Star Trek committee, um, and we're going to just stay on this um, WebEx rather than logging off and logging back on. So, um, Star Trek committee members, hold off on your questions. Anybody else? Fire away. And I think you can either type or speak. Right. So I'll I'll I guess people are shy. Um, I, I, will, I, I will ask first of all. Uh, by the way, you know you said your your small group. I remember meeting you, and Protocols IO was you and maybe one other person. So um, you've you've expanded tremendously. We have grown. We have grown. Right. Right. Um, my my. I'll just I'll just pick it up at the for the. Uh, the last thing that you talked about, which are incentives, because I, I also believe that in general, one of the um, one of the reasons we got into this whole reproducibility mess in the first place is um, you know the so-called perverse incentives that are well <laughs> well uh, established in terms of um, you know academic promotion, et cetera, uh, academic success. Um, but um, and I, and so I I think in a, you know if you can if you can leverage that in a positive way uh, by creating you know journals which you can then cite I think I, I definitely agree with that that approach I guess my my question is you know this is not necessarily novel there have been method um, focused journals Nature Methods Biotechniques come to mind how how is this different Lenny than than what's already been out there that that's a fantastic question um there are obviously there is a journal of visual experiments there's method x from elsevier um nature methods nature protocols i can go on there's a number of journals that are dedicated to methods um not all of them are open access uh, some of them um there's a recently launched one, I won't say which one, that uh, will charge you $5,000 per method paper. Um, it is open access, which is good for me as an open access advocate. It's a little bit of a steep price. Um, the partnership with PLOS One, one thing is, um, this is a new type of paper that they're now accepting because before it used to be research papers, right? But here they're acknowledging that the method itself um, is worth publishing. And it's not just them saying, oh, you can now submit a protocol, but part of this partnership is it's streamlined between protocols and plus one. So as an author, when you sign into protocols.io, if you have a public or private protocol, there is now a submit to plus one button, kind of like you can send your preprint from bioarchive to a journal. So that uh, exposes to the people who are using protocols.io, the thousands and thousands that have accounts that have protocols that you can get this peer review, you can get credit. We're hoping to make it easy. Um, the other part of the partnership with PLOS One is that if you have existing protocols and you're not on protocols.io, if you come and submit to PLOS One, um, you can actually send your existing protocols to protocols.io. We have an editorial team that helps to put it in privately we'll share with you so it's it's a beautiful partnership where we are trying to encourage publishing the methods uh, inexpensively open access providing value and then the protocol doesn't just show up in a journal it's done because 
as I was trying to highlight throughout the talk, protocols evolve, right? They're growing, uh, evolving creatures. Um, and so you get recognition, you get a paper, but because the protocol is sitting on protocols.io and the plus one article is pointing to it, it's not done, it's not fixed, and you can correct it, you can optimize it, right? You can keep improving it, and it's not a new paper every time, but you will clearly see the evolving nature, and if there are videos, structure, right, the catalog numbers of the reagents and antibodies inside protocols.io, we're trying to highlight and feature it. So it really is not just, let's take something on protocols.io and turn it into a PDF that you can then mention in your CD. So those are uh, the details around that partnership. Um, it's open access, there's costs, you should get rewarded for it, and it's going bi-directionally from PLOS One to protocols with our import through the editorial team and making it easier to submit your existing protocols. But great question. Great. So I have a quick question. Uh, this is Jack Collins. Thanks for your uh, talk. You, you talked about many of the protocols are computational and uh, that you back things up in GitHub. Do you also have a an API that goes the other way that if I'm already using GitHub that I could take and just basically click and get it into protocols.io. Because as you said, none of us want to do work twice when we've already done it once. Yep. Um, so we, we have, there is a read and a write API. Um, and if you send us a JSON format, um, you can go from GitHub protocol into protocols.io. So there is a right API as well. Okay. okay. I think that would be really uh, useful to let people know because um, if somebody could just click a button and basically publish in protocols.io, that would make it much simpler. I, I agree. And, uh, you know, one of the reasons we have an editorial team is to get over that. Um, so I didn't show it in the acknowledgements, but there is a number of part-time um, scientists who help us with when we're working with funders or like with plus one um, universities when they sign up for protocols.io we provide import and it, it relates to that question that you just asked which is if i have existing protocols they could be on github they can be in a pdf um, how do i get them in and we've done a lot both on the editor so that you can drop the steps from an existing word file into protocols.io and we parse them and turn them into a protocol for you so it's sort of semi automated to really low bar you just create a new protocol and drop a pdf in there um, and then later come back and make it step by step or you know that next step uh, which is supporting api based uh, writing but um the, the 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 challenge it's not just incentive the challenge is um there are different lab notebooks there are different formats um and it's it's not trivial um, particularly for scientists or as we keep keep talking about in, in in this hour for scientists who are really busy and are being asked to do a lot it's not trivial even if you build the most beautiful tool that saves you time, you still have to create an account, you still have to get your protocols in. So that's why it's something that takes a while. But I appreciate the question again. That's exactly why we have the um, API for writing to protocols.io. Yeah. yeah. One, one of the areas of specifically that we're running into where it's difficult is in AI because there's so many different ways that you can run things and, and so many different parameters. And one small change anywhere uh, changes the results and uh, the robustness of the field is gonna require something like this. I, I I agree. And as I said, I was doing a lot of bioinformatics and genomics in the uh, PhD and postdoc days. And um, it, 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 it makes a difference both for wet lab and computational pipelines, those details. Other questions? There's a question in the chat. Um, okay. I have a question in the chat, which is, can you track citations of the protocols? Um, and why is, there, why is there a raccoon for the logo? Is there a story there? So 
really good question um, for citations of the protocol. Um, a lot of people ask us for it. The we do check um, for protocol mentions in open access papers that are in PubMed Central. Unfortunately, most papers are still published in subscription journals. We don't have access. Um, people will often, even those publishers that have been opening up their citations, um, even in their journals, most often you'll see the protocol as a link with the DOI, um, not as a formal citation, but as a link in the method section. So unless we have full text access to, um, unless we have full text access to the papers uh, across the publishers, it's very hard for us to know when a protocol has been cited. So we do try to look for that information, but it's tricky. When a protocol accompanies a paper and nature, applause, genetics article, that we can figure out um, and we always try to point back to the paper and have under the title the name of the journal where it's published so you know what it's part of um, but over time as uh, you accrue usage and citations to a particular protocol that's still hard for us to track because we're not in an open access world um, and then there's a question about the raccoon logo um, excellent question there is a story when we rebranded, I think, a year and a half uh, ago, we used to have just a simple double check mark as our logo. Um, the, 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 there are multiple reasons for the raccoon. I tweeted about it. Uh, one is that the Latin name for the species, um, the, the, the Latin name for the species is Procyon loader, which means wash your hands. That's not exactly what they're doing. But if you arrange, rearrange letters in there, you can spell protocol. It's actually protocol -y, Um, but that's cute. Um, the other thing is they have great manual dexterity, which is what uh, a lot of wet lab um, biologists and chemists uh, need to do their experiments. And I think the third and most important reason is uh, raccoons are really good at finding free food, just like uh, graduate students and later on scientists. So for all those reasons, we went with the raccoon as our logo and mascot. Um, and there is another comment. Hi, Lenny. Um, great stuff. Any move toward a Yelp review, like feedback to weed out crappy protocols? Oh, that's, that's another fantastic. I love the questions, by the way, here, and I love that we have time for it. If you don't mind, let me answer that because that's a really important um, question. How do you weed out crap? We're not a journal and we have partnership with a plus one. There's peer review, but even peer review, right? Like um, as wonderful as peer review is, it takes time to figure out if a method really works outside of the lab that developed it. I always say that real peer review of protocols takes time and happens in other people's hands. So when you have multiple protocols, um, how do you know which one is likely to work? And if I do a search for Trizol, there will be you know, multiple results. So just uh, RNA Trizol extraction, um, we have 30 results for it. Which one is likely to work for you, right? And it's a really good question. Um, so one thing we do have is a sort of thumbs up. And the question that was asked was, do you have a Yelp like? We don't want people to say this is crap. We are not a journal that will certify a protocol as works or doesn't. But what we try to do is accumulate enough information and knowledge around the protocol to tell you which ones are likely to work or not. Right? So if we go to this one, there are under the title, Several people have clicked works for me. We have some protocols where 30 people have clicked it. You can see what are their names. We don't want the authors coming back and uh, all of their lab clicking works, works, works uh, for me. So when you publish a protocol, we ask you, is it working? Is it in development? Is it a negative result? What is the status of it? If you say it's working in our lab, you know that's one vote, but then hopefully over time, more votes build up. We also share all the metrics um, on the metrics tab around the protocol, right? How many people have exported it? How many people have bookmarked it? 
Um, are there forks on it? Are there discussions? So um, we can't tell you as a platform which one does and doesn't work. We don't know which one is crappy. I mean, some things you can see, hey, you just created an abstract and there are no steps. I don't think that's what protocols.io is for. We filter out um, every public protocol that goes live. Uh, our team does check, just like BioArchive, to make sure that it is a research, you know, uh, not a pseudoscience, not a spam or porn um, pollution on protocols.io. But ultimately, we don't know, is this going to reproduce? Is this robust? And our goal is to expose everything we know about the protocols, allow people to click when it does work, uh, a thumbs up, and hopefully over time you build trust in which method is more likely to work. And again, let me stop sharing. Other questions, other questions on the chat? Also, I imagine, uh, Lenny, that maybe there's a, a bit of a self-selection going on. I, I would hope that people are uh, who have <laughs> bad protocols are not going to be motivated to want to upload those to protocols io but i guess you never know um, um it's it's a good point so there is obviously in the earlier days of protocols.io when um it was really the people that knew lenny the people that heard me speak or then someone else from protocols.io speak before funders and publishers it was a very self-selected group, so um, you're right. But once more and more journals started putting us in guidelines, you will have instances where someone um, thinks, oh, uh, this is part of compliance. This will help me get my paper accepted. And you start seeing um, not great protocols, right? People yeah, are taking good. the time, just throwing a PDF in there, or they'll create a protocol and, um, They'll create a protocol and uh, just copy paste the abstract in. There are no steps. There's no attachment and you're getting attached. Like, uh, I think you forgot something. That's not what the platform is for. So um, as, as the visibility of the platform grows, you can't really rely. Um, but over time, when you do a search, things that no one is using, things that aren't great, things that don't have nice format and don't have the videos and are not protocols that are easy to follow. Hopefully they're lower down in the search results. So just like Google, you can still find crappy websites, um, but hopefully they're on page 10, 15, not the top three results um, over time. Great. Okay, so um, thank you again, um, Lenny. This was a terrific presentation. Also the first time I've ever heard a three spine stickleback parasite mentioned probably ever, um, but certainly in a scientific presentation. Um, so um, the uh, committee members, please stay on for the round table. We'll just um, keep it where we are here and everyone else. Thank you very much for, for attending. And um, we have several other, as you can see posted here, we have uh, five other seminars as part of this new series. So thank you again, Lenny. And if I didn't answer something or you were shy, um, I just put into chat again. I'm Lenny at protocols.io and happy to get any other questions we didn't get to um, during this. And thank you so much for the engagement and for the opportunity to present. Okay, so. Um... Let's see how many people stick around. <laughs> it's always a little uh, dicey when you when you give people the opportunity to either stay or go. Um, and this is our first. Uh, you are our our beta test, Lenny. I guess that might be appropriate. Whether or not it makes it into the protocols, uh, what we're doing here. <laughs> um, so let's see who um, I also recognize that you said land for yourself that this is your fourth meeting today. Uh, they yes, it is. Operated, my, my brain others. is pretty much mush. Um, it doesn't usually it doesn't it's it was just a, a complete um, weird convergence. So we have nine nine of us are I think um, 
several of us, because <laughs> it includes me and, and Kelly as well. But um, we have about seven members of this committee um, that we started, Lenny, that, you know, we really, it's, it's an organic uh, group of um, scientists. We are data scientists, imaging folks, um, um, drug discoverers, um, protein expression people. Um, and we have in common uh, an interest uh, uh, on the importance of, of standards and reference materials uh, and all things that really